I'm going to ask for our last few minutes before lunch, which everybody loves to be the speaker before lunch, for Jeff and Eric to come. Um, but we're interested in, in the perspective of those um, folks from states that have these laws on the books and what that means. You know, uh, one of the things I think um, um, we heard from North Dakota, um, Steve made pretty clear, the battle's not over in terms of there may be changes to the bill to make, but I think what you know Eric and Jeff can say, having a law on the books doesn't mean the battle's over either. Even if you're totally happy with the statute, you have a lot of work to do to make sure that that law becomes reality. So um, Eric, why don't I go to you first and let you um, tell, tell the story from Kansas. Well, it's funny, I was, um, I was preparing for this and I was thinking, what do we do to con consistently support what we're doing here in the state. And then I started making a list and all of a sudden my, my piece of paper was full. You know, next year will be the 25th anniversary of passing the law in Kansas. And it's amazing what an institution the law has become since it was passed, how it has grown all kinds of tentacles and barnacles that go everywhere in our state press association. One of the things that we take really seriously and is that we constantly remind our students and our advisors um, that this exists. And, you know, I think we take for granted, especially when we have longtime advisors at some of our schools, that, that everybody knows about the law. But there's a revolving door of students, certainly. They come through almost every year, every couple years. And there's an incredible revolving door of um, teachers that we, you know, we retrain teachers all the time. And so we have fall conferences. We travel three times. We travel each year around our state to three different locations. And we, we train our uh, students in this as much as we can with, you know, we had Mark as a keynote speaker. I acted as a keynote speaker the, um, the first year. We got a grant from the Pulitzer Prizes to ask students to tell their story of covering controversial issues that were empowered by our state legislation. The more that we do that, the more that um, we see the fruits of it. For instance, I had a group of students from a local high school, Blue Valley High School. They said, hey, we're going to go ahead and cover this story because you had this Pulitzer, you know, um, sanctioned um, presentation, and now we're going to cover something controversial as well, and we know it's protected. And so um, the more we just try to inject it went into almost everything that we do as a state. One of the things I wrote down is I wrote down, oh, we we sponsor the Administrator of the Year Award, and one of the you know one of the lines in it is that it needs to be someone who who protects freedom of speech. And then I look through the rest of our awards, and almost all the rest of them also have a plank in them that says supports freedom of speech. Whether it's our Educator of the Year, whether it's our um, our new teacher of the year, whether it's our friend of KSPA award, we have tons of awards and all of them have this freedom of speech um, aspect to them as well. So the thing that the thing that's really striking is, you know, because of Hazelwood, we've, ge we've trained a generation of students to say no, once you have this in your state and it's been around for 25 years, you have trained a generation of students to say, absolutely not, I'm going to run the story. And um, that's the part that's really, really exciting and empowering, kind of from the other side of it, especially with the distance of 25 years to it. Great, thank you, Eric. Tell us about Colorado. Well, uh, I was 10 years old when the Colorado law <laughs> passed. Um, we do enjoy the protections from the Colorado Student Free Expression Law, but it's not without some rocky relationships every now and then because, you know, it's about educating the educators and, and the administrators, and, and many of them um, just don't know. And there are situations in districts where uh, there just has been the practice of prior review. Um, but my first job on the board was as advocacy coordinator, and uh, in addition to presenting at, at, at state workshops and offering those opportunities for our students um, at both Colorado State University and CU, we, both, we have great relationships with both of those universities. Um, we, you know, I, I suppose the most gratifying, I think the a fun part of my job as advocacy coordinator was traveling around um, the state when needed and going into schools and sitting uh, in a meeting with a 
uh, advisor who was having issues with um, admin oversight or prior review and a department chair and someone from the um, union and superintendent you know one meeting in particular where all of those people were represented in the principal and um, it's it's shocking sometimes the fact that administrators just don't know they just have not been exposed to that until something happens um, so you know, another thing that we, we started talking about doing along with Jack Kennedy and, and Mark Newton and Kerry Faust, who many of you know, um, is adding explicit advisor protection to the law. And so we've had some breakfasts with state representatives. And one of the things that they've said is something you'll run into if you want to present that as a change to the law or an addition amendment to the law is... Um, you know, they're going to ask, what are you currently doing to educate teachers, advisors, faculty, administrators in the state? What can you show for your outreach? And how do we know that the advisors in particular are doing a good job? And so we started um, the Colorado Student Media Association Press Law and Ethics course for advisors and administrators. We've yet to have an administrator take the course, but we hope to have one. We always open it up to them. Um, but we offer it, um, and we offered it sort of in spurts. The first couple of years, we offered it, we ha and we had 12 advisors who became certified. They earn a college credit from a university in our state. Um, and I've, in, in your binder, I've included uh, a sheet that kind of overviews the course. And it's actually really recently, um, as in the last month or so, um, gotten some more traction, and I've had a lot of emails from advisors who are saying, when are we gonna offer it again? Because we had um, at our state journalism day, which is about 1500 students at Colorado State University, we awarded uh, Palmer Ridge High School students and their advisor um, who wrote an endorsement in their uh, newspaper um, during the election and were met by the Colorado Springs uh, community, which is a very conservative community by some resistance, the district got it right and stood by them. And we awarded uh, them with uh, Mary Beth Tinker and John Tinker armbands signed. And it, it was a great presentation. But after that, I think it kind of, and, and we've, we've heard a lot about this today that folks are kind of waking up and saying, you know, even in states like ours, oh, I, I need to arm myself with the knowledge and know the law. And so we're gonna run the course again this year. And uh, the, you know, the more advisors we can have become certified, then when we do wanna take that um, to, to the House and say, you know, we'd like advisor protection, um, explicit advisor protection. I will say also that um, two more things. One that I, I suppose we have talked about there being a little concern maybe that if you do go and open it back up and say we want to add some things to it, it might then, you know, it puts it out there. You know, we're enjoying the protections now. So I, I think we think about that. We don't want anything to send us backwards, but you know, you're looking for that key moment, that key supporter um, to do that. And then the last thing is just, we've been trying not with much success. We had uh, one conference that we were able to attend and present on, but trying to get into administrator um, education programs, whether that's through the Colorado Language Arts Society or the CDE, um, and then specifically at local universities that offer those administrator licensure programs. And Carrie Faust has been working on that in our state quite a bit. So, Adam, I'm curious, what percentage of administrators, high school principals specifically in Colorado, would you guess are aware of the law? And I realize it's just a guess, but... I would say half. Well, that's actually better than I might have yeah. imagined. So that's well, it. Well, I think it would depend on the area. Yeah, yeah. Th that's another challenge we have as a, as a student media association. And, you, and I know you all do three conferences in different locations throughout the year, but we're so spread out. You know, we're serving such a large area. And, you know, we do, we'll take trips to the Western Slope once a year. Um, but, you know, it's hard it, yeah. it, just in terms of boots on the ground. You know, Eric, I, I'm going to ask sort of a related question of you. The um, advisors, I mean, I'm guessing if you're a member of KSPA, you'd have to be pretty thick not to know about the state law. Um, but there are a lot of advisors who aren't members of this state organization. What, what, what percentage of high school teachers who advise student media 
would you guess in the state are aware of you know the law? Yeah, I think I think that's a I think geographically it's very concentrated. I think on the eastern side of our state, it's almost everyone is a member of KSPA and almost everyone knows about the state law. And then you know the job requirements become so much. Uh, different as you move into rural areas and people are asked to advise student media who don't have certifications in it and have never been trained in it and um, it's much less likely that they're aware of the law and quite honestly it's much less likely that they're ever going to test the law too. you know the the content that they're putting into their publication you know it just doesn't aspire to be anything that an administrator would ever have a problem with and so it is irrelevant to them in like five different ways you know another big um, uh, distinction that we have found that really makes people either care about the law or not care about the law is whether they are advising newspapers or yearbooks and there just are not very many newspapers in our most rural areas and so they are much less likely to want to test that. Um, this is changing a little bit as um, schools are finding how inexpensive um, news websites are. All of a sudden, a newspaper is, um, is okay if it doesn't cost quite as much money. And so we're seeing that kind of bubble up a little bit more. And so it may become a little bit more of an issue as, because um, students perceive yearbooks and newspapers differently and the content that goes in there um, is different as well. Questions, Bob? So have there been any challenges or lawsuits, libel suits, or whatever that have resulted that, that your state, I'm hoping that you'll say no, <laughs> um, especially being neighbors here in Missouri, um, but that's one, of the cons that's one of the things we'd like to be able to tell uh, during the testimony is that, you know, Kansas has had this law for 25 years and there's never been any problem. So I'm wondering if, if you can grant that affirmation or if you're aware of any cases. Yeah, I mean, asking the lawyers who've been in the state since since the law has been passed, there's nothing that's formally gone to court that we can locate. I think that it has, um, it's been a specter in many um, things that have happened between um, advisors and administrators. I know of some advisors and administrators who it's gotten very, very contentious between them and even with the law hopefully acting as a buffer, there have been, you know, I know of some, at least one media advisor who knows that there is a letter in his file about what he did and how he didn't uh, do what the district asked even with the law behind him and that was really the best that he felt like he could do there wasn't there's you know there there are you know three things that are protected within our law in terms of being relieved of duty or dismissed but there doesn't say anything in terms of the retaliation that the Maryland statute does. So I, I, I think the short answer is no, but the other answer is that things that we still wish were protected by the law, um, they still happen, and there's, there's only so much that we're able to see the law protect. You know, Kansas also ha is the only state where there was a bill introduced that didn't go anywhere to try to repeal the law or to amend it. And, and based on a controversy that occurred um, there, and, and um, it was pretty much a lone legislator, it appeared, who was really behind this, and which is why the bill didn't succeed. But um, it did raise the prospect that, you know, laws can be changed in the same way school board policies can um, if there's the motivation to make that happen. So. While I have the microphone for just one second, I wanted to say this because, and this will be something I'll reach out to the larger group um, outside of the conference as well, because this is our 25th anniversary um, in February of 2017. In September of 2017, rather than have the roadshow of conferences that goes around the state, we're going to unify and have one large state conference, and we're going to hold it um, in Topeka, which is our state capital, and we're going to um, celebrate the law. And this is something that we're really cognizant of is, you know, to what degree are we celebrating? To what degree are we giving thanks? To what degree are we prancing around and showing what we've got? And what degree are we, um, are we kind of showing off? And we want to really strike the right balance in terms of um, showing 
um, gratitude, but also celebrating the constitutional rights that were given as well. And, um, and we really want this to be a place where um, state press associations like your, your, your own might come and visit and we can kind of enlarge um, the, um, the rights that other neighboring states do, including especially Missouri, um, who's working on this as well. Um, so if I can, just for one second, I had like a bullet point of other things that we do, like a short list, and I won't go into uh, to a lot of depth with them. So the repeated programming that we do through the state, through the fall conferences, I think that's really, really key. We do have a standing First Amendment committee as part of our board that we um, revisit um, at every board meeting. Um, we're celebrating the 25th anniversary. Another thing that I'm sure Mark would like me to say too is to keep your archives of all of the stuff. So those of you who have just recently, um, you know, passed these laws, please like keep those archives. When Mark came to visit, we, I was able to set, you know, a ton of binders in front of him and say enjoy. So please make sure to to um, to indulge the free press law nerds in your camp that will want to come back and uh, check it out as well. Um, we also support our mentors, our me the JEA mentoring program, um, and th through that, your, um, your young educators are going to get a lot of support. We are now in the process of adding our second mentor, and we could honestly support a third mentor within our state with the number of new teachers that we have. So I think that's really, really important. Um, this sounds maybe kind of an odd note to strike with free speech, but I think contests and competitions, I know Ozma does an amazing thing as part of their um, critique service where they actually ask to like almost certify a school as like a free speech zone. Um, this has been something that we've thought about doing within Kansas to just acknowledge um, every year, yes, this is a school where the state law is supported. I think that's a really, really powerful thing to do. And the more competitions you have, the more people know that, you know, good um, free speech is going to be rewarded in these kind of competitions um, as well. And then we're thinking about adding more uh, an explicitly free speech um, award to our docket of awards where each year we would um, award the best free speech or the best um, student expression that, um, that does that sort of like some national awards um, that already exist. And then the final thing I would say is anything that you can do to connect yourself to university um, that supports um, scholarship on this kind of stuff. Peter Bobkowski is here and we have two other academics at the University of Kansas, um, John Peters and um, Janelle Belmas, and they have been incredibly aggressive about in investigating and figuring out things that um, that re relate to free speech and student free speech and that has been incredibly invigorating for our members so um, anything that you can do um, with that as well so sorry I just wanted to run oh, through that's those. Great. Yeah. Other questions? I would just add real quick. Yeah I, please. I teach at a Jesuit school and uh, one of the things that Michael said really piqued my interest um, about Creighton. And uh, certainly, if you have folks in your state that uh, at private schools who are um, looking to talk to their administrations or develop policies, you can have them reach out to me. Also, uh, you know, you'll take a look at a school like Creighton. We send you know, 30 to 60 students a year to Creighton from our high school. And uh, I would really encourage if you're looking to get that college media, private school media law, uh, or part, part of the lobby for private schools, colleges, I would really look to Jesuit universities um, because they'd be a great starting point. If I can just add to that, Creighton's dean retired just this past, journalism dean, just this past May. The new person took over July 1st. I talked to her two weeks after she was on the job. I'm sorry. I forgot about that. The uh, Creighton's dean retired in in June on June 30. The new person took over July 1st, and uh, I talked to her two weeks after she was fresh on the job. She didn't quite know what her sea legs were yet, so I haven't been back with her yet. But I I know Creighton's reputation. I'm not too worried about that. I just want to make sure that we actually do have their support when we go on, go forward. Um, 
I forget the woman's name, I have it written down somewhere, but anyway, I think I had it on the uh, PowerPoint. But it, having their support, though, is going to be really key for the private colleges. Mm -hmm. Our association alone, in Nebraska Collegiate Media Association, has three private colleges in it, and then the three state schools, and then some of the, uh, the, the two-year schools, the community colleges. So we're sort of small as an association of only about 10 institutions, maybe. But that would be, that would be huge to get those. Yeah, and that's what we're after. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's give Jeff and Erica a hand.